Welcome everyone to this self-knowledge course. In today's lecture, we will see one of the 48 laws that govern the physical world, the law of the pendulum. And for us, who are on the path of self-knowledge, knowing this law is vitally important because it will allow us to understand how we can really get to the truth about anything, and how we can get to the truth that is within ourselves. In this conference we will learn how this law works, we will understand how this law is handled both in the external world and in our internal world, and we will learn how to transcend it to reach the truth. The pendulum is a weight that is hung from a fixed point so that it can swing freely, especially a rod with a weight at the end, which served to regulate the mechanism of ancient clocks that worked thanks to the oscillating movement of a pendulum. And this movement is deeply significant since it makes us reflect on how absolutely everything that happens over time in this world, in our lives, and in our psychology, moves according to this movement, according to this law. In this life everything ebbs and flows, rises and falls, increases and decreases, comes and goes, according to this wonderful law. This law teaches us that everything is subject to the fluctuation of time, that everything evolves and devolves, that everything goes from one extreme to another. And it teaches us that the truth is not in any of these extremes. In lecture number 8 of this course, we were studying the laws of evolution and involution to which everything in this world is subject. The law of the pendulum comes to teach us that this process of evolution and involution, of rising and falling, growing and decreasing, is permanent in everything, that it doesn't stop. In ancient times the dogma of evolution did not yet exist, this is the dogma that has led many people to think that everything is evolving continuously, and that the human being has been developing through an evolutionary process. And that this evolutionary process will lead the human being to become by the mere action of the time in a superman. Thus, ignoring the law of involution. But the ancient wise men did understand perfectly how the law of the pendulum works, since everything that evolves and reaches its maximum point, inevitably begins its process of involution. And this can be observed in the same civilizations that have existed on earth. We can observe how Egypt emerged with all its power and became a civilization that reached great levels of development. However, when they reached their highest point of development, a continuous and progressive process of decline began, undoubtedly passing to the other side of the pendulum. Nothing remains of that majestic civilization but ruins. More so when Egypt fell, Jerusalem rose on the other side. The beloved city of the prophets. But when Israel fell as a great power. When the pendulum shifted, the Roman Empire emerged on the other end. That law of the pendulum has governed all the great powers that have arisen, and really, if we look closely, we can see that absolutely everything is subject to this law. However, we can see how this law also applies to plants, animals, and humans. Since we see how a human being grows, develops, reaches that stage of his life in which he enjoys strength, youth, beauty, and power, and at that moment he usually feels as if that state is going to be eternal. But we see how inevitably, at that point, his process of decay begins, the years of old age arrive, and with them illness, decrepitude, and death. We can also observe this law in the formation of a company or business. We see that when it reaches that limit where it is experiencing its best moments, where it is giving the best profitability, the pendulum begins to move in the opposite direction. The movement of this law is relentless. However, if we begin to understand what the true purpose of this law is, and how this law also moves in our inner world, then we can use it to achieve wisdom. If we study our own psychology, we will see that we also find this law moving there. Since all our emotions, thoughts and desires oscillate according to the law of the pendulum. All humanity is bipolar. We go from liking to disliking. From pleasure to pain. From being happy to being sad. We don't maintain a permanent balance. And this happens because all our psychological defects are bipolar. Each of them has two poles, the active pole and the passive pole. On the one hand, 
We find laziness, as that lack of desire to do something, that need to be sleeping, or to be doing nothing. And on the other hand, we find laziness, as the desire to do many things that are not really important or productive, such as the desire to do thousands of personality things, and then not having time, or enthusiasm, for things that can lead us to awaken our consciousness. On the one hand, we find greed as our hoarding and stingy self, and at the other pole we find it as that wasteful self, that self that wastes its resources. At one pole we find sadness, at the other we find joy. At one pole we find hatred, at the other, infatuation. However, we tend to confuse the passive pole of a self with a virtue. But what we must understand is that virtue is not found in either extreme. Virtue, conscience, the real, is only found in the center of the pendulum. But we often make the mistake of clinging to one pole of the pendulum, believing that by holding on tight we can make that state permanent. We cling to pleasure, and what we don't see is that with the same force that we cling to seeking and experiencing pleasure, with that same force, the pendulum will swing the other way, and we will have to experience pain. The more attachment we generate towards a person or thing, the more we suffer when we lose it. The pendulum will always swing. And the more we go to one extreme, the more force we give to that pendulum, and then the more force it will take us to experience the other extreme. The more excited someone gets with the expectation of something, the more they suffer when they can't get it. The more excited you get about getting something, the more frustrated you get when you lose it. We can even see how the pendulum swings in a relationship. You see that when the relationship begins, both desire, mind, and emotion go through a process of ascent, falling in love, idealization, romance, and passion. However, we see that the more intense this process is, when conflicts, misunderstandings, etc., arise, with that same intensity the discussions occur, the stronger the lack of love and even hatred comes. And the common thing is that couples, if they stay together, remain in that constant pendulum movement, going from stages of romance and passion to stages of fights and arguments. Until a very strong conflict occurs, or boredom sets in, or betrayal, and then they change partners. But only to continue on the same pendulum, but with another person, without ever finding permanent happiness and stable peace. And the interesting thing is that this happens to us with everything, we spend our lives trying to achieve stability, happiness, and a state of permanent peace. However, because we mistakenly seek it by clinging to one end of the pendulum, we never arrive at the truth. Now, how could this be avoided? Observing and reflecting. Observing at both extremes. For example, in a relationship, observing everything that leads us to feel like, and everything that leads us to feel dislike towards the partner and work on those aspects with psychological death. When we are moving towards falling in love and infatuation, we must eliminate from us all the psychological aspects that want to lead us to that emotional, mental, and sexual overflow. And likewise, when we are moved by lack of love, discontent, or rejection towards our partner, we must eliminate all these aspects with psychological death. Then the pendulum begins to lose strength. We no longer pass so quickly through the center, which is balance, the swing of the pendulum slows down, and we will be able to see the truth more clearly, which is the midpoint, balance. We could even, through the reflective meditation technique that we learned in Lesson 22, meditate on the scenes of our lives in which we experience, in relation to any psychological defect, the two sides of the pendulum. 2. Through the elimination of the inner states that we experience at both extremes, reach the center of the pendulum, and come to an understanding. The truth is in the center, in the balance, in observing both extremes, reflecting and eliminating both, pleasure and pain, joy and suffering, to keep ourselves in the present moment, in balance, in what is permanent. It is in the absence of pain, and in the absence of pleasure, that we will find happiness. In the absence of hatred and in the absence of infatuation, we will find true love. True love is eternal and permanent. We will only know peace and true happiness if we eliminate the psychological defects that keep us going from one extreme to the other.
But the egoic mind resists balance, the ego finds it boring, it prefers to let off steam mentally, emotionally, or sexually, because that makes the ego feel alive. But then we will not be able to avoid, since this is a law, being impacted by the other pole, which is emptiness, pain, and sadness, and feel it in the same magnitude with which we felt pleasure. This is the purpose of this law, to make us experience both sides of the coin, so that, when we reflect on them, we see that neither at one end, nor the other, will we be able to find the truth. But we also see this law of the pendulum, in relation to our beliefs. When we believe in something, or when we don't believe in something, we are simply at one end of the pendulum, we are simply holding on to a concept. We can place the various pseudo-esoteric and pseudo-occult schools, religions, and sects on the far right of the pendulum. We can place all the materialist, Marxist, atheist, and skeptical schools on the extreme left of the pendulum movement. It is very common to see how the religious fanatic, due to some unusual event, or some great disappointment, can go to the other extreme. Like praying to God for the life of his sick child and expecting to be helped after a life of religious devotion, but it turns out that the child dies. Or upon being defeated in a debate by an esotericist, in desperation he may swing to the other end of the pendulum and become an atheist, a materialist, the skeptic. On the other hand, the materialist, atheistic fanatic, faced with any unusual event, perhaps a transcendental metaphysical event, or in a moment of unspeakable terror, can go to the opposite extreme of the pendulum movement and become a terrible religious reactionary. So, we see that the truth is not found in any concept, in any party, neither extreme right nor extreme left. But it happens that, because we believe we are wise, we fanatically defend any position, belief, or theory, without any verification. And it is only to find ourselves facing the swing of the pendulum, to see ourselves change our position, our beliefs, or our way of thinking. Neither spiritualist currents nor their materialist adversaries will ever be able to lead us to the truth. Since they are all based on beliefs, on concepts, not on experimentation or verification. Spirit and matter are two very debatable and thorny concepts that no one really understands. If they ask us, what is matter? We could give a concept, we could say that it is everything that occupies a space. Or if we are asked, what is the spirit? We can give one or more concepts. It is consciousness, universal energy, God, etc. But these are just concepts. The mind knows nothing about the spirit, it knows nothing about matter. Only when we get rid of all the concepts, the ones we have in relation to one extreme and the other, the concepts we have in relation to the spiritual, and the concepts we have in relation to atheism or materialism, and the concepts we have in relation to anything, to give way to direct verification, then we will come to know the truth. For example, someone could talk to us about astral projection, or we can watch lecture 3 of this course and see the practice for astral projection. But that theory is going to be just a concept that we can believe or not believe in. And we can begin to fill ourselves with thousands of other concepts that support our point that that is true or that that is false. But as long as we don't go and do the practice, as many times as necessary, until we verify for ourselves the reality of astral projection, we will only be dancing between the concepts of one extreme and the other. A concept is nothing more than that, a concept. And reality is not a concept, although many concepts can be forged about reality. But we tend to label all things and form thousands of concepts about things, and therefore, we stop experiencing reality, and only see everything through the concepts we have about reality. And we believe that the more concepts we have, the wiser we will be, but by never directly observing and checking things, we do not realize how all these concepts are what distance us from the possibility of really knowing something. Because the more concepts we have, the less things we know, because we have not really verified any of them, we just believe them. The more concepts we have, the more we will have to unlearn to truly know. We must understand that the truth is not in beliefs. What we think or believe about something is not the truth. 
The truth is what we verify directly, and as long as we continue to cling to concepts and beliefs, we will never reach the truth. Neither the extreme right nor the extreme left is the truth. Neither supporting this concept nor the other. When we defend something according to our mind, we become slaves to that concept. Fanatically, we attack those who don't think or believe the same as us. If we believe that God is in such a place or in such a religion, or if we think that the truth is in such a theory, or if we believe that this knowledge is the truth, without having verified it, or on the contrary we believe that it is false without having verified it, we tend to feel superior to those who think differently, and we believe we have the truth. And so, we defend or reject many concepts, and debate defending our supposed truth, which in reality is only a concept. Any psychological discipline is opposed by another discipline, any logically structured psychological process is opposed by another similar one. And after all, what? We believe we are more intelligent, wiser than others, and we don't realize that we are only being slaves to a concept that is not the truth, since the truth is outside of every concept. That is why Jesus said, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. He, who is at one pole of the pendulum, criticizes and rejects those who are at the other pole, and always believes that he has the truth. But he who has already found the center, doesn't criticize. He, who has already verified the truth, understands. So, he doesn't believe he has the truth, because he himself is the truth. Therefore, when we are arguing with another, judging, and criticizing another, we don't have the truth, we are polarized. What is the truth? This is a very interesting question. When they asked Jesus, what is truth? The master remained profoundly silent. And when the Buddha was asked the same question, he turned his back and walked away. And with this action both masters gave us a profound teaching. The truth cannot be conceptualized. Everything that can be said about the truth is not the truth, since the truth is only found in inner silence, in the absence of the psychological self. The truth is the unknown from moment to moment. It is not among the coming and going of theories and beliefs. The concept that the mind can form about the truth is never the truth. The opinion we have about the truth, no matter how respectable it may be, is in no way the truth. We must empty ourselves of all our unverified concepts, and seek truth in direct verification, through our own experimentation. The truth must be experienced, not believed, or assumed. The truth is something that must be experienced directly, like when you put your finger in the fire and get burned, or like when you swallow water and drown. So where is the truth? The truth is in the center of the pendulum, not on the extreme right, nor on the extreme left. Therefore, we must begin by observing and recognizing when, and in relation to what, we are polarized. In relation to our concepts, our beliefs and in relation to each of our psychological aspects. Only when we are able to observe our inner pendulum, then we can observe and eliminate, through psychological death, those aspects that keep us at one extreme or another. The center of the pendulum is within ourselves, in inner silence, when we are fully living the present moment, in self-observation and psychological death. And it is there where we must discover and directly experience the real, the truth. We will only find the truth in the inner silence. When we eliminate the psychological self, when we eliminate the different ways of being that manifest in desire, mind, and emotion, we can know the truth. Because only consciousness can experience itself. And only through psychological death is the essence, which is the real, released. The truth has nothing to do with what has been said or not said, with what has been written or not written, it only comes to us when the ego has died. We must understand that the mind cannot seek the truth because it does not know it. Our mind is invaded by psychological defects. The truth comes to us spontaneously when we have eliminated all the undesirable elements that constitute the myself, 
the ego. As long as consciousness remains bottled in the myself, it will not be able to experience that which is real, that which is beyond the body, beyond the affections and the mind, that which is the truth. So, we must learn to find that critical point where the truth is, where consciousness is. The pendulum is constantly swinging. The top of each swing of the pendulum occurs when we believe we have the truth. Then the pendulum begins its way backwards towards the other extreme, and at the other extreme when we believe that we have the truth, it begins to move towards the other point, and shows us that we do not have the truth, since the truth is not found in neither extreme. This is the profound teaching contained in this law. If we observe our inner pendulum, we will see that it constantly moves from the mind to sex. So, to reach understanding, in any situation, we must avoid polarizing ourselves in mind or desire. We must keep that internal pendulum balanced. Stay in the present moment, focused on the heart, which is our center, in inner silence. So, if a situation arises that leads us to react psychologically, to form an opinion, to criticize, to doubt, etc. We must observe ourselves to perceive the movement of our inner pendulum and balance ourselves, to be able to maintain ourselves in that inner silence, in that state of wakefulness and self-remembering in which consciousness can manifest, so that we can perceive the truth. We eliminate the desires that arise, and we return to the heart, we eliminate the thoughts and justifications, and we return to the heart, to receive in the heart the wisdom of the Father that comes as intuition. This is how we keep our inner pendulum balanced, and thus, we will reach comprehension, the truth, in any situation. Comprehension is a faculty of the heart that allows us to reconcile opposites. I leave you with this phrase to reflect on. Of what use it is to a man to know a thousand theories if he has never experienced the truth. This has been today's topic. I hope you find it very useful for your own inner work. Remember to leave all your questions in the comment section. I invite you to the next conference, in which we will study the method to awaken consciousness. And we will talk about the two consciousnesses we have, the objective and the subjective. A very interesting topic. Thank you for joining us on this topic. Until next time.